Hello and welcome to the lecture for chapter 22 on the topic of electrostatics. This begins the first, the first of a few chapters to cover the topics of electricity and magnetism. And we're first just going to start by defining what an electric field is and related topics. Okay, so we want to talk about the electrical force, all right, so the forces that are exerted between electrical charges. Think of it kind of like the gravitational force. We're going to talk about conservation of charge, Coulomb's law, which is the big law that defines the strength of the aforementioned electrical force. Define the difference between conductors and insulators, superconductors, um, how you charge something, what is charge polarization, then what is the electric field, what is the electric potential. These are big definitions in electricity and magnetism, the field and the potential. And then finally, how you can store electrical energy in things like a capacitor. All right, so what is electricity? Well, electricity is the name given to a wide range of electric, electrical phenomena, such as lightning, a spark when you strike a match, and what holds atoms together. So all of, all of those interconnected ideas are, are called electricity collectively. Electrostatics, if you wonder where that term comes from, because it has the, the word static in it, involves electrical charges. It talks about the forces between them, the field that surrounds them, which here we call an aura, and the behavior of them in materials. And this is in contrast to electrodynamics, which is basically current, which is the flow of charges. Okay? All right, but for here, for here, we're talking about charges that are at rest, hence the term electrostatics. All right. So the idea, the big overarching idea is this. Opposite charges attract, like charges repel. And really, that is, you know, the wonderful starting point for this, this whole discussion. If you have two positive charges, they will push each other away they're going to experience a repulsive force. On the other hand, if you have opposite charges, a positive and a negative, they will experience a attractive force between them. Okay? There will be a force that actually pulls them together. That force, we will see, is proportional to the charge and the product of the charges and the distance between them. Okay? So what are the particles that inherently have charge? Well, there's protons. Those are, tar those are particles that are inside the nucleus of the atom. Think about when we discussed the structure of the atom briefly in an earlier chapter. These are positive electrical charges, and they repel other positive electrical charges, which means that there better be something to hold the nucleus together, but that's a story for another day. Then there's electrons. Electrons have negative charge, and they repel other negative charges like electrons, but they are attracted to positive charges and likewise attract positive charges, so they are attracted towards the nucleus. All right? On the other hand, there are neutrons which are neutral. They neither have positive nor negative charge, okay? And the neutrons exist inside the nucleus as well, all right? So what are the fundamental facts about atoms? Well, every atom is composed of a positively charged nucleus surrounded by negatively charged electrons. The positively charged nucleus is made positive due to the protons that exist inside of it. Each of the electrons in any atom has the same quantity of negative charge as this, um, and the same mass, all right? So they're all identical. Protons and neutrons compose the nucleus. Protons are about 1,800 times more massive than electrons, but they all carry the same amount of positive charge in magnitude that's equal to the negative charge of each electron. So the, the fundamental charge of the proton and the, and the electron are identical in strength. Neutrons have slightly more mass than protons, about 1 one eight hundredth, one one eighteen hundredth more mass. So essentially, the mass of a, of a proton and an electron together total the mass of a neutron. No coincidence there. But they have no net charge. Atoms usually have as many electrons as protons, so the atoms have zero net charge, unless they become ionized. Okay? An ion is a, um, well, positive ion, that is, is an atom that has lost one or more electrons, thus it has more positive charge than negative charge, because that positively charged nucleus gives it a net charge. So total positive charge. On the other hand, a negative ion is an atom that has gained electrons, has extra electrons, so it has a net negative charge. Electrons in an atom, the innermost ones are attracted very, very strongly to the oppositely charged atomic nucleus, whereas the outer, outermost ones are attracted loosely and can be easily dislodged. So the idea is the electrons that are most likely to be lost by a particular atom, especially those that have multiple electrons, say unlike a hydrogen atom, those, those electrons are easily lost if they're very far from the nucleus because it turns out that they can't feel that attractive strength from the nucleus as easily. They're also shielded by the inner electrons because those inner electrons are kind of repelling the outer electrons. So examples of electrons in an atom and the manifestation in the macroscopic world 
are things like when rubbing a comb through your hair, electrons transfer from your hair to the comb. That means your hair has a deficiency of electrons and it becomes positively charged, okay? Because you're, you're basically stealing electrons from your hair. When rubbing a glass rod with silk, electrons transfer from the rod onto the silk and the rod, just like your hair, becomes positively charged. So when you brush your hair and scrape electrons from your hair, the charge of your hair is, well, of course, it's positive because it's lost electrons. Now, what about conservation of charge? Well, the idea is that charge cannot be created or destroyed, right? Charge can only be moved from one place to another. So electrons are simply transferred from one, one material to another, okay? Charge cannot be created or destroyed. Even when we talk about high energy phenomenon that's changing matter into pure energy, like converting, um, you know, like fusion or fission, even then charge is conserved, often through the creation of additional particles like a positron, which is a positively charged low mass particle that has the mass of an electron. So even, even in these types of phenomena where you're converting matter into energy, um, you still have conservation of charge, always. Okay? Now Coulomb's law is the law that quantifies the force between charges. Okay, that's the big takeaway. Is it's, it's the one that's actually going to give us the strength of that force. It is relationship among electri electrical charges, charge and distance discovered by Charles Coulomb back in the 18th century. States that for a pair of charged objects that are much smaller than the distance between them, the force between them varies directly as a product of their charges and inversely as the square of the separation distance. What it looks like in equation form is this right here. This is Coulomb's law in equation form. F is for force. All right. If the charges are alike in sign, the forces repel. So then the forces would be uh, away from the two, the two particles. If they're opposite in charge, then the force is going to be attractive and it's going to be pointing towards their centers. All right. K is called the, is called the electrostatic constant and is nine times 10 to the negative or nine times, nine times 10 to the positive nine Newton square meter per Coulomb squared. Coulomb is the unit of charge. All right. Is the fundamental unit of charge. So if something has a coulomb, that's actually a lot of charge. Mostly the charges of small particles are going to be the order of, well, microcoulombs or even less because an electron has a charge that is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. All right. So we have a very, very small amount of charge on a individual electron. Okay. This law, Coulomb's law, is really similar in form to the law for universal gravitation. It's just we replace K with a big G and then replace the two M, the two Ks with Ms, M1 and M2, and then we'd have D squared. And there we would have the fundamental law of gravitation. So notice they really, really are the same sort of law. They have a fitting constant, either the electrostatic constant or the gravitational constant. They have a product of something, in this case, a product of charges instead of masses, but they are both divided by meters squared, okay? Also notice that the Coulomb is a new fundamental unit, is a new base unit of, um, of physics because we have seen at this point the base units of temperature, Kelvin. We've seen the base units of mass, the kilogram. We've seen the base units of time, the second. And last, we've seen the base units of distance, the meter. At that, that has been our entire tool belt of base units. We've needed no other base units, although we have had plenty of derived units for pressure and wave ideas and all of that. But... Here, now, moving into a new branch of physics, we have a fundamental unit. Particles fundamentally have charge. It's something different than gravity. It is a separate phenomenon entirely. All right, so according to Coulomb's law, a pair of particles that are placed twice as far apart will experience forces that are, think about the formula, one quarter as strong because the force is inversely proportional to the square of distance. So if you double the distance, you cut the force by a quarter. All right, where you cut it into a quarter. You reduce it by 75%. Differences between gravitational electrical forces? Well, electrical forces may be either attractive or repulsive. That's different because gravity was only attractive. So big difference there. It complicates things a bit, but it also allows for a lot of flexibility that was not the case with gravity. Now there's something called charge polarization, and we can illustrate it here with a balloon. Charge polarization is most pronounced in insulators, and let's see why. So an atom or molecule in which the charges are aligned with a slight excess of positive charge on one side and a slight excess of negative charge on the other. That is the definition of a polarized atom or molecule. All right, it's polarized because now it has poles. It has a positive pole and a negative pole. 
Here I drew it kind of in an elliptical shape because perhaps those poles have stretched out the overall shape of that atom or molecule. All right, an example of polarization is when you rub an inflated balloon on your hair and then place the balloon on the wall, the balloon sticks to the wall due to the charged polarization in the atoms or molecules of the wall because these individual atoms are gonna have positive on one side and negative on the other. And they're actually more molecules than atoms, all right? But this is the idea, there's polarization, and that polarization then is gonna make a net force that's gonna attract, because the attractive force between all the negative charge built up on the surface of the balloon is going to be greater than the repulsive force, because this repulsive force between the two negative charges, this one and this one, they will the further apart. And so that slight, slightly greater distance is going to make, make that repulsive force weaker than the attractive force between the negative and the polarized positive end of the wall molecule, okay? So conductors and insulators. Well, as I said, polarization is pronounced in insulators. Why is that? Well, let's consider what a conductor is. A conductor is a material in which um, one or more of the electrons in the outer shell of its atoms are not anchored and basically are free to wander around. Metals have a bunch of free electrons. It's like a sea of free electrons. They're just tons and tons of them are maybe able to slosh around from one place to another. That means that they're not really going to um, polarize. They're actually going to have full, in terms of these individual atoms and molecules won't polarize. Instead, they're just going to lose all, their, all these free electrons. And they're just going to move to one side of the overall metal sample. On the, other hand, on the other hand, insulators are materials in which electrons are tightly bound and belong to particular atoms and are not free to wander about among other atoms. So rubber and glass are examples of insulators. Now, to complicate things a bit, there's also semiconductors. Well, semiconductors is, is a case that is somewhere between an insulator and a conductor. And let's read about some of the details. Well, it's a material that can be made to behave sometimes as an insulator and sometimes as a conductor. So that's the important thing about a semiconductor is there's, there's some property that you can change in that substance, maybe because you put enough voltage in it to overcome or so on, or sometimes it's even temperature dependent, but you can basically change the material back and forth from insulator to conductor. That's what, that's what separates semiconductor. So it makes for basically a switching mechanism, which is why it's so important in computer design. All right, so it falls in the middle range of electrical resistivity between insulators and conductors. They are insulators when they're, um, when they're in their pure state and they're conductors when they have impurities. And that, that refers to the way they're actually made in terms of how much particular material is mixed in. Think silicon and mixing in different substances to make combinations of silicon and other materials. So semiconductors conduct when light shines on it. All right, so that's one that is photo activated. So if a charged a selenium plate is exposed to, um, to a pattern of light, the charge will leak away only from the areas exposed to the light. So when you buy a water pipe in a hardware store, the water isn't included, obviously. When you, buy, when you buy copper wire, electrons are included. They're already in the wire. And that's an important idea about current, is we think about current as you know, flowing through the wire and that being a bunch of rushing electrons. In reality, the electrons are only moving at centimeters per second. And really, a given wire isn't going to you know, have its electrons replaced very quickly at all. Instead, its electrons are gonna bounce around in random motion. It is, the, uh, it is the electrical wave, the actual, the actual, um, the actual um, electrical field wave, the effect, the domino effect that travels at the speed of light. The electrons move quite slowly, all right? Something in, in uh, contrast to semiconductors is the other end, which are superconductors. These are just conductors, but they have zero resistance. So that means they allow for infinite conductivity, almost like a pe perpetual motion, motion machine, but not mechanical motion, just the emotion of charges. So once electrical current is established in a superconductor, the electrons will flow indefinitely. They'll never slow down and stop. They'll never lose their electrical energy to heat energy through random motion. With no electrical resistance, the current passes through a superconductor without losing energy. No heat loss occurs when the charge flows. All right. And yes, superconductors do exist. They usually can only be maintained at low temperature, but there are some examples of room temperature superconductors. All right. So charging. Well, you can charge something by friction and contact. Essentially, then you're converting mechanical energy into the energy of the electrons, so into electrical energy. And we mentioned electrons being the carrier of electrical energy because usually the protons are, are anchored to the nucleus and they're not going to be readily able to carry that charge. Now, you could, in an example of fluids, sometimes have ions, positively charged ions, that are carrying the charge. But usually in solids, or almost exclusively in solids, it's the electrons that are carrying the charge. So examples of charging something up, stroking cat's fur, combing your hair, rubbing your shoes, those are all examples of taking mechanical energy and turning into electrical energy. 
Electrons transfer from one material to another simply by touching. So when a negatively charged rod is placed in contact with a neutral object, some electrons will move to the neutral object. So that, that's an example of charging through direct contact and allowing that flow of the charge carrying particles, in other words, the electrons. All right, you can also charge by induction. So induction does not require contact. And how does induction work? Well, it, base, it works based on the Coulomb force and the fact that you don't have to have things touch in order to experience the force. And this is just like the gravitational force. It is a non-contact force. It is a force that exists and permeates space and doesn't require contact, as, as opposed to these mechanical forces such as tension and the normal force and the buoyant force that require contact, because ultimately those are forces that are created by more fundamental ideas, fundament, fundamental ideas that we are now starting to discuss in this course. So if you bring a charged object near a conducting surface, electrons are made to move in the surface um, other, to the surface of the material even without physical contact. An example here is induct inductive charging inside this cloud. All right, so the negative charge at the cloud induces a positive charge on the buildings below, right? This could be like a lightning cloud, right? Bring up that positive charge. And that's why sometimes when you have a, charge, a, cl a charged cloud like this that is charging up the ground below, bringing, bringing basically pushing all the electrons into the ground and then thus creating a negative or a positive net, net charge on the surface of objects, particularly tall objects where you have a lot of concentrated charge, then you can have ionization of the air and lightning. Ionization of the air takes, takes a huge amount of energy, but it is certainly possible, all right? So a great example of um, inductive charging can be shown here with the example of some charged metal um, spheres that are um, on insulating pedestals. Okay, all right, so here's the idea. Consider two ins uh, insulated metal spheres A and B. Again, they're insulated because of the pedestal, which means they're, they're not in contact with the ground. They can't lose charge to the ground. They touch each other, so they're in, fact, they're in effect, they, they form a single un uncharged conductor, and that's in part A. All right, well, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring in a negatively charged rod. So when a negatively charged rod is brought near A, electrons in the metal being free to move are repelled as far as possible until their mutual repulsion is big enough to balance the influence of the rod. The charge is redistributed. Look how it's redistributed. We're holding the rod here, and we've basically caused all these free electrons to flee to the other side. And that has created a net positive charge here. In other words, all the atomic nuclei that are left behind because they're part of the actual um, lattice of the metal, like the solid metal, well, they have, they've lost their electrons, so they have a positive charge. This does not mean that actual positive charges were pulled to this side because the positive charges are not free to move. It's just that the positively charged nuclei are left behind and all the free electrons are concentrated over here. All right? So now, while continuing to hold the rod close to A but not touching it, and it's important not to touch it because if you touched it, then all the electrons are just redistributed and you just have one neutral object, which would, come, which would include the rod and both spheres. All right, again, that would happen if the rod was brought in contact, but we are not bringing in the contact, very important, okay? But while the rod is continuing to be held some distance away, and ultimately the insulation here is the air that's insulating the, um, the rod from the sphere, well, you then pull B away, all right? You separate B. Now think about what you've done. Now you've created two equal and oppositely charged spheres. Because now that they're separated, the charge that, that was you know, a neutral system between all of them, basically just one big metal, um, you know, kind of barbell-shaped piece of metal here, now is two separate spheres, one with a positive net charge and one with a negative net charge. Okay, and then we can just take the rod away and they will remain charged. All right, they will slowly lose their charge because there's no such thing as a perfect insulation and they will slowly become neutral with their environment, but that might take a long time. All right? So a further example of charge polarization is occurring here at the atomic level. So one side of the atom or molecule is induced into becoming more negative. And this is the, this is the idea that was happening at the scale of the wall and the balloon that we mentioned um, earlier. So the atom or molecule is said to be electrically polarized. An electron buzzing around an atom, atomic nucleus produces an electron cloud. It's just a probability cloud that has to do with um, quantum mechanics and the fact that the electron is not really a particle but more of a wave particle. The center of the negative cloud normally coincides with the center of the positive nucleus of an atom. However, when an external, when an external negative charge is brought nearby um, to the right, the electron cloud is distorted so that the center of the, neg the negative and positive charge no longer coincides and the atom is now polarized. It essentially has become like a battery, right, with a positive end and a negative end. 
So if the charged rod is um, negative, then the positive part of the atom or molecule is tugged in a direction towards the rod, and the negative side of the atom or molecule is pushed in a direction away from the rod. The positive and negative parts of the atom and the molecule become, al become aligned. They are electrically polarized. All right, so here's an example of all of those atoms becoming electrically polarized. Now, this example of, of atoms becoming polarized like this is only really going to happen in an insulator. Again, because if you bring the negatively charged rod in, uh, nearby a conductor, what happens? Well, you don't have a bunch of polarized atoms. Instead, instead, all the free electrons are going to move some macroscopic distance away, which, of course, we saw happening right here. Okay? But in the case of an insulator, then since the electrons are not free to move, they're trapped within their individual atoms, they still become polarized if the negative charge on the rod is strong enough. So when a charged um, comb is brought nearby, um, nearby, molecules in the paper are polarized. The sign of the charge closest to the comb is opposite to the comb's, the comb's charge, and the charges of the same sign are slightly more distant, right? And that's the idea where the net force ends up being Positive. So the attractive force is bigger, as shown in the larger font, as, as, as opposed to the repulsive force. The repulsive force is between the like charges. The attractive force is between the opposite charges. Okay? And that means that the paper will get pulled towards the cone. Okay? We see this sort of effect with electrostatics. We can see things get pulled towards each other and attracted. All right? And here is the balloon again. So rub an inflated balloon on your hair and it becomes charged. Place the balloon against the wall and it sticks. This is because the charge on the balloon induces an opposite charge on the wall. Again, closeness wins. Okay, it will always win. Okay, so many molecules, such as water, are electrically polarized in their normal state. Okay, and this is, this is particularly pronounced in water. Water is very polarized. The distribution of electrical charge is not perfectly even. There is a little more negative charge on one side of the molecule than the other. Such molecules are said to be electric dipoles. So they are permanent electric dipoles. What, what, what does dipole mean? It just means it has two poles. It has a positive pole and a negative pole, okay? Just like a magnet has positive negative poles or a battery has positive negative poles or a, um, a natural dynamo like a planet has a positive and negative pole like our planet Earth, all right? So now to understand some of these ideas, let's talk about an abstraction called the electrical field. The electrical field is a force field. Okay, so it is a field, it is drawn with field lines, and what it denotes is the idea of force, which is important so we don't get lost in it being an abstract idea. All right, so what is the electrical field? Well, the space surrounding electrical charge, um, an energetic aura. It describes electrical force, and around a charged particle, it obeys the inverse square law, and it represents force per unit charge. Okay, so the electrical field points in the same direction as the force on a positive charge. Okay, and that's important because the field could be defined to either be the force on a negative charge or a positive charge because those force directions are opposite each other. They're 180 degrees opposite, okay? Wherever, whatever way a positive charge would go, an electric charge would go the opposite way, 180 degrees, right? Opposite, okay? Now, that idea is great, but we have to remember that the electrical field is not unambiguous. It is set for positive charges only which is kind of weird because elect after all electrons are the, the things that are actually moving most of the time. But regardless, the electrical field is defined for the motion that a positive charge would, would go in or the force that a positive charge would feel, okay? It is opposite the direction of an electron, right? So in other words, if I place an electron here, what direction it would go? It would move in this direction because it would flow opposite the direction of the field. Which makes sense, after all, because this is a positive charge, such as a proton, so the electron would get attracted to the opposite charge of the proton. All right? But the field lines radiate away from the proton. So that means that all protons' positive charges create locations where field lines radiate away, like, like we would cartoonishly draw the sun's rays radiating away from the sun. All right? So field lines are drawn to radiate away. The proximity of field lines tells us the relative strength of the field. So as you get closer and closer to the proton, the field lines become more closely packed together, denoting a stronger and stronger force, which makes sense because the Coulomb force says that field lines are inversely proportional to the square of distance. And here we see that represented in terms of the pictorial representation of the field lines. Closer packing of the field lines close to the positive charge. All right? So... Both the Lillian and the spherical dome of the Van der Graaff generator are electrically charged, and we can actually see the idea of the field lines represented in her hair. Okay, so this leads to the idea of electrical potential. 
because if we're talking about field lines and that being a force field, then just like gravity, we have the idea of potential energy. Well, there's also such, the thing, such a thing as electrical potential energy, but we can actually divide by the, um, the charge and get the idea of electrical potential, which is an energy, but instead is energy divided by charge. So electrical potential is joules divided by coulombs. So in other words, it is energy divided by charge. Okay, and the, the, what's nice about doing that and discussing something called electrical potential, which is again energy over charge, is it, is it is then dividing out the effects of charge. So that way we have an electrical potential regardless of how much charge we put into a particular field. Okay, so electrical potential energy is the energy possessed, possessed by a charged particle due to its location in an electric field, because electric field denotes the force. Work is required because if we're talking about force and we're talking about a distance, then we should be talking about work. Because recall that work is the product of force and distance. Okay, so work is required to push a charged particle against the electrical field of a charged body. Okay, so um, the, to continue the idea and the analogy with mechanical systems, the spring has more mechanical potential energy when compressed. The charged particle similarly has more electrical potential energy when it is pushed closer to a charged sphere of equal charge because it wants to be repelled. So pushing it inward, inwards is like compressing the spring. When you release that positive charge, it will, get, it will start flying away because it will be repelled from the large positively charged sphere. So electrical potential, voltage, so I'm sure you've heard that term, is electrical energy per charge. It is energy per charge. Remember, it's joules divided by coulombs. All right, is possessed by a charged particle due to its location. May be called voltage, potential energy per charge. All right, so voltage is potential energy per charge. It is also called electrical potential. Electrical potential and voltage are synonyms. Electrical potential and voltage are synonyms. The unit of electrical potential is the volt, okay? So you measure voltage in volts, okay? All right, so in equation form, electrical potential is electrical potential divided by the amount of charge, as I said before, okay? So electrical potential, voltage, all right? The unit is the volt and it is one joule per coulomb, all right? So for example, twice the charge in the same location has twice the electrical potential energy, but the same electrical potential because it's independent of the amount of charge because after all, we divided by the charge in the definition, okay? So electrical potential energy is measured in joules. Electrical potential, on the other hand, is measured in volts, all right? So electrical potential, high voltage can occur at low electrical potential energy for a small amount of charge. On the other hand, high voltage at high electrical potential energy occurs for lots of charge, all right? So you can also have a case where you have very high voltage, like this balloon has 5,000 volts, which is you know, a huge amount of voltage, you know, way more than the 120 volts in our wall, but it's not deadly because it's very low charge. There's actually very few charge carriers. And so the energy would be low even though the voltage is high. So what about storing energy? Well, electrical energy can be stored in a common device called a capacitor. A capacitor is like a, a temporary storage system for um, electrical energy. The simplest capacitor is just a pair of conducting plates separated by a small distance, and that separation creates insulation because the air is an insulator. All right, you can also replace the air with a better insulator, okay? So they're not touching each other, which is important because if they are, then they just become neutral. When the plates are connected to a charging device, which is converting chemical energy into electrical potential energy, then the electrons are transferred from one plate to another, and then they have that storage, all right? So, um, so you can then um, have that energy stored. This occurs as the positive battery terminal pulls electrons from the plate connected to it, and these electrons, in effect, are pumped through the battery, and because th that's what the battery is doing, okay, through the negative terminal to the opposite plate. The capacitor plates then have equal and opposite charge. The plate on the positive plate connected to the positive battery terminal, and the negative plate connected to the negative terminal. And we'll talk about the flow of charge when we talk about current in the next chapter. The charging process is complete when the potential difference between the plates equals the potential difference of the battery, right? It's create, it's, it's reached an equilibrium. The battery voltage, right? Remember that's electrical potential, energy divided by charge. The greater the battery voltage and the larger, uh, the larger and closer the plates, the greater the charge that can be stored. The energy stored in the capacitor comes from the work required to charge it. Discharging a charged capacitor can be um, a shocking experience if you happen to be in the path. All right, so a common laboratory device for producing high voltages and creating static electricity is called the Van, Van der Graaff generator. And what it is doing is taking a motor and mechanical energy via friction and thus um, charging up and converting that mechanical energy into electrical potential energy on the surface of this conducting metal sphere. All right, 
Well, that concludes our introduction to electrostatics and some ideas we're going to continue to see in the future chapters, such as the definition of charge and how charges interact with each other. All right. Well, thank you so much for watching.